Good evening. Welcome, you guys. I am Karen Mayer Cunningham, Special Education Boss, helping individuals that sit at the 504 IEP table have successful student outcomes. So welcome. Today's training is on transition. What is transition? What do I need to know about transition? How do I make sure that my student is set up for success, whether he graduates for post-secondary success at 18 as a senior or is in need of 18 to 21 services? And so um, one of the things that I think that we do really well is we fight really hard for our kiddos in special ed to get assessments, services, um, evaluations when they're little, right? When they are first identified. And I think that as kiddos get older, you have a lot less um, involvement at the junior high and high school level as it relates to your child's IEP meetings. And so most parents wouldn't even know it, have no idea what you mean by transition. And so we're going to explain what that is, um, what is the point of it, and how to use it effectively, um, and to make sure that your student is set up for post-secondary success. And so what is post-secondary success? It's the same legal threshold that we have for every single student in America, and that is that they would have gainful employment, independent living, and further education. You know, years ago, we had kiddos in special ed, and we, we graduated them, and we didn't set them up for success or tools. Um, to for that post-secondary part of their life, which is the longest part of their life, right? Our kiddos don't evaporate at 18. And anybody that's been a parent of a young adult, you know that the older they get, the more that they need you. And so I want you to think about transition and what does that mean, post-secondary um, success. And sort of the easiest way to think about it is what would you do for your kiddo who was neurotypical? Now, that being said, I've never met anybody neurotypical. If you know somebody neurotypical, congratulations. But if your kiddo didn't have a disability or struggle in school, you wouldn't wait till, I don't know, April of their senior year and go, hey, Bob, what are we going to do with Billy, right? You would have started planning um, years ago um, to set him up for success as it relates to that, which it is that he wants to do after school. And so it's not any different for kiddos with disabilities. I think for parents with kids with a disability, especially if it's profound or moderate, there is an assumption that our kiddos will go to the 18 to 21 program or that the school is just going to tell me next steps. So let me give you a secret. They're not, they're not going to tell you next steps. It's like any other kiddo. It's your job to go out and find those resources. And so we want to kind of give you a framework of what that looks like um, and how to partner with schools and write um, robust IEPs uh, so that your kiddo is moving that direction and we don't just go, oh, he said he wanted to be a gamer, that's cute. But then we really make sure that we are targeting um, those areas based on his unique needs, what he wants to do post-secondary, begin to equip him and then make sure that we are not, um, you know, painting ourselves into a corner because we've written IEP goals that they don't need the 1821 program. I would love to tell you that every school lets every kiddo just come on into the 1821 program because they need that. That is not my experience. My experience in the last, I don't know, maybe seven years, there was a very abrupt turn. And we are here in the great state of Texas and I'm in the great city of Houston. And literally, I think it was about seven years ago, we got kind of locked down on 18 to 21. Um, and the IEP meetings ended in phrases like, well, it's time for her to grow up. Wow. And so parents assumed because a child was in life skills or was profoundly impacted by their neurological difference or maybe an adaptive behavior unit that they would just continue for a full school day in that 18 to 21 program. And that is not accurate. Um, and that's my experience across um, school districts. I have the, the opportunity and the blessing to um, advocate from coast to coast. Thank you, TikTok. And um, the, the needs and the concerns are the same across the board. And why is that? Because our kiddos that are gonna go to the 1821 program, they're an investment, they are. And so what we care about, we fund, what we focus on, we fund. And I find often that school districts are not really um, prepared um, or even their own staff knows what that post-secondary outcome transition pieces are or are supposed to be. And so I'm gonna share sort of a framework of what that is. We wanna give you guys resources so that you, like anybody, when you sit at the IEP table, that you are the special education boss so that your kiddo can have successful 
student outcomes. So let's talk about transition. What is transition? Well, transition is setting your kid up for success. And here are the three federal thresholds. And you should write this down. Um, gainful employment. And then we're going to kind of unpack each of those. Independent living and further education. So I think a lot of times parents get um, confused or misled. And a lot of times if we, as parents, we don't see another child with our child's like disability, we assume that they can't be employed. Well, here's what I know, I don't know a lot. If you're breathing, you can be employed. And so I can't tell you how many of my families that the school has literally said he is unemployable. On the open records from ninth grade, he's unemployable, unemployable, it's unemployable. And so parents have no reason not to believe that, um, we just um, want to do process on a student that um, was told from ninth grade on that he was unemployable. And, um, you know, it's not about winning that. It's about changing um, the antiquated perception about kids with disabilities and what does that look like. And so many years ago, I had um, the opportunity to be um, a past commissioner for the mayor's office for people with disabilities in Houston, two terms. And I really learned about um, supported vocation, supported vocation. And so that is available to you. It's probably not something that maybe even your school district knows about um, and certainly may not have encountered. So all of us have the tendency to do things the same way. Um, we are in an amazing um, country. We have amazing opportunities for kiddos. Um, we usually have access to really rich resources. We just don't know what they look like. So for instance, um, Texas has an amazing program called um, DARS, um, built with rehabilitative services. Well, the um, logo for them um, a while back was a wheelchair. So I didn't really think my kiddos would need that if they didn't have a wheelchair. So sometimes when you have agency names, it's hard to really understand what services they would provide to your kiddos and how they would benefit that. So we wanna to try to unpack that for you guys a little bit. If your kiddo is in a self-contained unit, an alternate setting, or has high behavioral needs, whatever their disabilities are, um, they may be a candidate for um, an 18 to 21 program. I have had kiddos that were um, in all gen ed and they went to the 18 to 21 program. I had a, um, many different settings. We think that it has to be a life skill setting or an adaptive behavior setting. These are kiddos that need more education post high school so that they can meet those three thresholds, okay? So be sure that you know that and if your kid is in need of those services. To get those services, you have to have already set up a plan indicating that need. And that plan that indicates that need is your IEP, it's your Individualized Education Program. And so when I get clients, um, as we heard in this due process hearing, he met his IEP goals. He met his post-secondary goal. He's met his post-secondary goal. Well, yeah, because you told the parent he was unemployable. So the student had IEP goals to follow directives, um, comply within three prompts, um, and then the, the usual cast of characters, right? Your one vocational goal, you had two behavioral goals, and I don't know, science, social studies, math, and all of that. So inside of your document, you need to make sure that you have goals that are related to those three thresholds, gainful employment, independent living, and further education. We're gonna kind of unpack that. So how do you write a successful transition plan? So depending on where you are in the United States, um, at minimum, at the latest, it starts at 16. The federal law says that we have to build into a transition supplement a plan when students with disabilities are 16. Now, as I said at IP meetings, I do about 500 a year because I like to grind my teeth. Um, usually the transition supplement is the same thing. Here's Billy, here's what he likes. Um, his transition goal is to uh, finish high school and go somewhere. I, that sounds fantastic. So that's not really a transition supplement, right? A transition supplement is going to tell me what are his needs and how am I going to get there by involving the entire IEP team, the student with a disability, and the parents. So the post-secondary goal is an outcome that you're looking for after high school. It's an outcome that you're looking for after high school. 
Okay, so the first thing that you're gonna to wanna to have um, to build that transition plan is an age appropriate transition assessment. An age appropriate transition assessment. So hopefully your school will provide your student that age appropriate transition assessment, but they may not. So in Texas, um, we start transition at 14. And so um, often that means my kiddo a couple days before his IEP meeting talked to his case manager. I talked to him. You did? Mm -hmm. What does he want to do? And he likes woodworking and um, computers. Okay. <laughs> so, and we sit at the meetings and they're like, we have really good electives. So the reason that you want to know what the student wants is it, it's the student's life. It's their transition, right? And don't we be limited by what you think is available? Ask your student, what, what is it that they want to do? What do they enjoy? Do they enjoy being around people? Or do they not enjoy being around people? Do, you know, those are, I had a kid at one time in a transition meeting. He said, I want to wear a uniform and I want it to be air conditioned. I was like, amen, I am right there, right? And the parents and even the IEP team at that moment kind of dismissed that. But we don't dismiss what a student with a disability wants. We listen to them. And we capture that so that we can build a plan to make them successful. So the first thing you need is an age-appropriate transition assessment. So usually in the software, wherever you are in the United States, there's a supplement, a transition supplement. Um, and we can provide you a, a blank template if you need that. And it talks about the student's strengths, their needs, um, skills, living skills, community-based. There's, there's many components of it. And based on all of that, you get... Um, um, a, a trajectory of what the student's deficits are, their unique needs to um, address so that you can meet that post-secondary goal. So there are many evaluations that you could use. I would ask your school, when your student is 14, 13, 15, 16, please tell me what, a, what transition assessment you use. Please tell me what transition assessment you use. Just because of school filled out a transition supplement doesn't mean that they use a transition assessment. I rarely find that a school uses a transition assessment at all, at all. Um, I find kiddos that um, are profoundly impacted by their disability might be given a picture inventory, which makes me a little uncomfortable sometimes. Um, and so they're given this sort of limited um, picture inventory and they circled them. But there are many transition assessments. The very, very, very best resource that I've ever found is the Oregon Transition um, Program. It's a very robust, I think the, the, the PDF is almost 70 pages long. It is amazing and all so many resources in that. But you need to ask the student at whatever their capacity is, what is it that they want to do, right? And just because you don't know what that looks like long-term doesn't mean it can't be done. They have to assess what the student's post-secondary goal is before they can put a plan in place. Next, you wanna identify or update post-secondary goals. So a post-secondary goal is an outcome after high school, an outcome after high school. So um, a lot of times I'll have uh, post-secondary goals that simply say, um, Cindy will you know, go to a four-year college. She wants to be, I don't know, an artist and um, she's going to get all of her high school credits to graduate. That, that's not a post-secondary goal. One of the goals that I recommend to IP committees is I would say this. So Cindy wants to go to school to be whatever. Every grading period, Cindy will provide her case manager, your case conference person, whatever you call it in your county or your district. Cindy will provide three brochures, printouts, pamphlets. They make pamphlets anymore of a place of higher learning that provides the instruction that she's wanting for that degree or certificate, right? So if you want to be, you know, a digital programmer, who does that, right? What does it cost to go there? What's the probability of you getting in? When people graduate, do they make $10? So that you begin to give a child a framework whatever their disability is, is probability and outcomes, right? Not just, I want to do that, right? And so that's where you start to plan. Then that puts the onus on who? The parent and the student to work together to deliver that information to the case manager. 
right? And so that's when you start to, to tease it out. Because when I have kiddos that are 14 and 15 and you know, they want it to be this, they want to be a YouTuber and they want, I don't know what they want to do. You have to start, who doesn't want to be a YouTuber, right? You have to start directing them to where do you get that education, right? If you're going to be a YouTuber, what classes are you taking on for, you know, video streaming? What kind of lighting do you need? What is the probability that you can build a social media platform? Those are all real things, but you have to help them work towards that outcome. So I do it by grading period so that every grading period, the student has a responsibility working with their parent to explore those places that provide the instruction around the outcome that they're wanting. And then they provide that information to their case manager. Why? Like anything else. So we can track that, right? What I wanted to do in ninth grade, uh, I don't want to do it anymore. I didn't know that was $400,000 to go there. I didn't know that the only place they have it is in, is in Minnesota, right? So you want to begin to unpack that, right? Um, next, you're going to want to um, invite the student to attend the IEP meeting. So, you know, when we're engaging a student in an IEP meeting for post-secondary success or transition, there, there are three categories, right? Before the IEP meeting, during the IEP meeting and after the IEP meeting. And I have very specific thoughts around students at IEP meetings. I have a, I have a saying that I say an IEP meeting is rarely a place for adults and it's never a place for children. Am I always right? No. If you have a student that can meanif meaningfully, meaningfully participate in an IEP meeting and they feel comfortable doing that, then certainly invite them, right? It's your child. However, as in a parent of a child with a disability, um, it's your decision whether or not they participate in the IEP meeting. I don't want a kiddo just standing there going, um, I would like to be a fisherman and I like my family. I, I don't want it to be scripted. I want it to be something they're comfortable at. And so um, I, I feel like a lot of times you can get the information that you need to build that plan. Previously, um, I find that when children come into a meeting, and there are 20 people looking at them or seven people, it feels a little bit, you know, sometimes punitive for the child. So we don't want that. However, not my decision. It's your decision whether or not your child comes to an IEP meeting. Um, I've been at many schools and they're like, oh, he's coming. Oh, it's a requirement. It, it's not. And so um, often people will have students come to the IEP meeting for transition and talk about that piece first. And then let you know Billy go back to class. So those are important parts. Obviously, we want a child, whoever they are, to be part of, you know, input and speak to outcomes and what they want. But it's not a requirement. It's not a have to. I've sat in many IEP meetings where the student just sits there and it, it's just painful, right? And and obviously in the IEP meeting, we're talking about a student's deficits more than we're talking about their strengths. And we talk about their deficits so we can build a program around that, right? And so you want to be really cognizant of um, their level of participation. When's the right time to come in? Um, are you having the IEP meeting during their favorite class? Then they probably don't want to come in. Um, I had a student one time in a transition meeting and um, he was adorable. He goes, when I leave, you're going to tell him what I want, right? I said, yes, this, yes, I will tell him what you want. Okay. Number two, number four, invite parents to attend the IEP meeting. So I think that we have a, um, a misunderstanding between invitation and participation. Invitation and participation, right? If I'm invited to your house to a dinner party and I come in and everybody's sitting at one table and I sit at another table and you've planned everything out, I don't know if I'm participating. Um, I've been invited, but we want parents to have meaningful participation at the federal requirement. It's the procedural right. Parents are the number one federal stakeholder um, for the IEP committee, right? Parent, um, local education agency um, representative, somebody that can interpret and answer questions about assessments, and then general ed and special ed. And often, I don't think that there's malice in it, but we um, invite them to the meeting and we go down the IEP and we go like this. Do you have any questions? Do you have any questions? Do you, have any que do, do you agree with this section? I like that. Do you agree with this section? Do you agree? right? That's not really meaningful participation. You want to, whatever the IEP meeting is, to get that information from parents ahead of time. Like what do they want their child to do? A lot of parents already have a plan 
and they come into an IEP meeting and they don't know the lingo and the acronyms we use and you know all the supplements we have to do this this and this and go through this and it's um sometimes they leave with just you know their eyes glazed over so reach out to a parent ahead of time whenever you have an IEP or 504 meeting and get their input this is not how you get their input do you have any concerns that, that's you wouldn't go to lunch with your friend and go do you have any concerns you'd have a conversation tell me how your kiddo is doing functionally tell me how your kiddo is doing in behavior tell me do you have any areas of need around academics do you have any areas of need around their um, language so that you get them to participate wholly and then you, you indicate to them the importance of post-secondary outcomes and how you get there when we get to an IEP meeting for parents and we sort of rattle through the transition supplement most schools will have populated in the transition supplement great resources great resources and at the end of that we go do you have any questions and so I will tee it up for a client and say, hey, they're talking about TWS, Texas Workforce Solutions. Do you know what that is? Even though I know what that is. Yeah. And so you want to make sure that you are going over those pieces. There's great resources, but if they don't know what they mean, they're not going to be beneficial to their student. And so I think sometimes we, we fall between compliance and best practice. And I don't know about either one of those. I just want to do what's right by kiddos. And so we need to fully inform and let parents participate in the IEP meeting. Next, you wanna identify transition services and activities. Identify transition services and activities. So in Texas, it says that there needs to be um, a, a, um, activities, right? A set of coordinated activities, write that down. A set of coordinated activities to reach your post-secondary goal. So writing a goal, that he will be a fisherman after high school, not a set of coordinated activities. So to ask your school, what are the set of coordinated activities that you're going to use above regular teaching to help him be sec a successful post-secondary? Help him be successful post-secondary. There are transition services and activities. Some of those might include, but are not limited to, your school might have WBL, whatever you call it in your state, work-based learning, right? Is my child probability, probably going to go to a four-year college, a two-year college. Does he need, you know, that vocational training? Because you can kind of deep dive that and start that early um, in, in high school, right? Do we want him to go out to work-based learning to one hour a day, two hours a day, half the day? And that's where our kiddos with disabilities go out and participate. I call it the trial it before you buy it in um, employment settings, right? A kiddo might go, oh, I want to work at Party City. I love Party City. They find out when they actually go there and work, it's not as much fun as going there and shopping. So ask your school, what are transition services and activities that you have? If they don't know, ask your state education agency. Ask your state education agency. They absolutely know. Next, you want to identify measurable annual goals. And so we're going to park here for a little bit. So my kiddos that are headed to an assumption that they're gonna have 18 to 21 services, it, depending on when I get them, they've never had really post-secondary or transition goals in their IEP. So, you know, I meet them in February of their senior year, they, they didn't have any. So what is a post-secondary goal? So the three thresholds are gainful employment, independent living, and further education. So let's just unpack that. If you're an adult, what do you need to be successful living. And so I write goals around that. I'm going to need to have evidence that I can live based on the same thing that everything everybody else needs to live on. That I have the ability to budget and buy products and food and supplies for my home, whether it's in a supported living, whether it's in a group home, whether it's a student that just has a roommate, or it could be a student that's just living in his room. What does that mean to be an adult and have successful living? So I've had goals that said, Billy will um, show the, the four steps of cleaning a kitchen as evidenced by a video submitted to his case manager. And we'll do it at this success at this grading period and this grading period and this grading period. Whether or not your school's ever had heard of that goal doesn't really matter. But if you're grown, you're going to be able to, you're going to need to be able to clean your kitchen. You're going to need to be able to clean your bathroom. You're going to need to know the steps of doing laundry. 
You're gonna need to know the steps of finding transportation to school or work. You can write goals around that. I find that schools are unbelievably resistant to that. Um, and I find, I'm sure, it's, I'm sure it's just me, that schools require me to bring them the goals. So same kind of goal that you would have for anybody, right? Um, I wrote a goal for a kiddo that um, was for um, you know, gainful employment. And so I had him go to school in the 18 to 21 program. When he got there, he changed into a uniform. He changed into a different pair of pants, a different shirt, and he had a lanyard. Why? That's real world. We get dressed to go to work, right? Most of us don't work in our pajamas. Some of us do, right? And so that helped him see what it looks like to work. Um, and they were very clear that we, we don't do that, you know. And then we had him do all sorts of things that would be relatable to what it's like to go to work. And this was the student that they said was unemployable, right? So you're gonna have to craft those goals. We have a great thing called the internet and they have post-secondary goals. There are great websites. There, there's a transition guide from the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services for the United States Department of Education. They have an amazing program. So there are sites and banks that will help you write post-secondary goals. I wanna be working on that goal in 10th grade. I wanna be working on that goal in 11th grade. What does that look like? If I'm greatly impacted by my disability, you want to reach out to your state and local agencies for information about supported employment. What does that mean, Karen? You can have supported employment. Let's say that you are a student who is affected by cerebral palsy. Um, you have, um, you're in a wheelchair and you have limited language. You can have supported employment. If, if you want to go and um, work with people or greet people or work for a short period of time, you can have somebody that works with you from the state. It's not my experience or an agency that the school is going to either know about that or know what that looks like. So um, look to your city. Um, your city um, would have information about um, people, the office of uh, people with disabilities. Your state would have information about that. Um, agencies that relate to children with adults with um, autism or an intellectual disability would have information about that but you can have supported employment. Your employment for your student doesn't have to be eight hours a day. It doesn't. So um, I have kiddos that have supported employment and they are volunteers. So we're, we're all cooked to grow up and do something and you are gonna have to craft that for your child with your disability. It's unlikely that the school is going to just know what that looks like because we all kind of do things the same, right? We send our kiddos that are greatly impacted by their disability to kind of do the same number of tasks at a job. And so you're gonna to have to reach out to those state agencies. Um, what does that look like? Um, and there's amazing, you know, we have social media now. There's lots of kiddos that have jobs and they're supported by their parents. Um, there's a young man in Houston, I can't think of it right now, but he's a professional shredder and he goes um, with his mom and he goes to businesses and it's bonded and they take businesses documents that they're done with. and I think he has a big shredder in the van. Um, and so that's supported living. We have um, a young man that I, I did an event with. His name is Nolan. Um, and he had Nolan's sweet heat. And um, he loved making jellies. And he has a huge business. I think it's in Waco now, supported by his mom. So you can have supported vocation. Um, and those services are available through agencies um, and your state and local levels. But you have to have goals that are tracking towards being successful as an adult. What are those skill deficits that your student doesn't have, right? Um, as it relates to money, as it relates to getting around, all those things that we need to um, be successful as adults. Next, identify courses of study. I think that we get kind of stuck here. We think of kiddos with disabilities um, as not being able to access college, right? Um, I sit on the board of Texas A&M University Center for Disabilities and Development. We have a wonderful program at Texas A&M for individuals with an intellectual disability and or autism, and they now can go to college at Texas A&M for four years. We have a wonderful program in Houston called the VAST program at HTC, um, and you have to have a third grade reading level 
and you can go to college. So there are opportunities for your child to have post-secondary education. It's not all or nothing. And so you need to begin to tease that out. When does transition start? Before they're born. That's when transition starts. For any of us moms and dads, it all comes too quickly. So you want to begin to in investigate uh, what those are and what are what's the application process? Um, what is the cost? Um, and you know the probability, how do I get my child there? If I'm going to get my child to those programs, I'm going to take my child out of school in high school and I'm going to go visit those programs. Um, that's how you know what would be successful for students. Uh, but there are many courses of study. Um, and then eight, teacher reports progress on annual goals. And this is the between, right? We, we get so involved at the IEP meeting. Whoo, we got that done. And then we have an IEP meeting, 30, 60 structural weeks. What happened in between? What did we do, right? Was he benefiting from that? Did, are, we, are we doing things to make sure that we're moving the T so that he can be successful long-term? Um, and are we getting him ready for life after high school? Life happens after high school, with, whether you want it to or not. But those things are driven by the student's wants, preferences, interests, options, and strengths. So write those things down. Your student's post-secondary goals are driven by his, not yours, not his advocate, not the teacher, not because this is what kids with that disability do, but they're driven by his wants, his preferences, his interests, his options, and strengths. I had a little girl one time that I advocated for, and she wanted to work in a daycare. She loved children. She had an intellectual disability. She wasn't going to be able to work in a daycare because you have to be bonded. But we set up a program within the district where she was able to go in and read in the library to kindergartners. She loved that. She got the outcome that she wanted. She wanted to work with kids. It benefited other people. But the district wasn't really open to that, right? And why are we not open to things? Because we've never seen it done successfully, right? So you're going to be the one that goes first. That's fantastic, right? Um, and look on websites. What are other young adults or um, adults with disabilities doing for a vocation. They're doing lots of things that you haven't thought of yet. And so make sure that you're thinking about what that is. Look at their interests. Say, what's the probability they can do that? If they couldn't do that, what's another way to do that? So she could work with kiddos. Um, and they followed her around the, like the Pied Piper. It was wonderful. Um, it was a volunteer position, but she went to work every day like everybody else. So <laughs> We're going to go more into a deep dive, but I'm going to give you some framework of what you have to have. So we have to have a transition assessment. If you don't have a transition assessment, you are not populating the transition product right. You just don't. You're just guessing. So you have to ask your school, what was a transition assessment? You have to have that built around what? The PLATH, the present levels of academic achievement and functional performance. What is that? That is the part of the IEP where I pick up and it describes the student's disability and unique needs and how it impacts them across settings. So we're going to have to assume how are his unique needs going to affect him if he goes to work. If he goes to work at Walgreens, will his, you know, blurting out affect him um, and his coworkers? It might. So that's a unique need that you're going to need to work on so that he can be employable, right? Um, <clears throat> Uh, post-secondary, measurable, I like that word measurable, measurable post-secondary and transition goals, um, annual IEP goals and objectives. We're trying to have those around what is the content, uh, the core requirements to graduate. What are the transition services and activities? What is the set of coordinated activities that you've developed for Billy to be successful post-secondary, gainful employment, independent living, and further education? What are the courses of study my child with a disability could take afterwards? What could he participate in? Often, respectfully, our kiddos that are greatly impacted by our disability, we either think they stay home with us or they go into a home. That thinking hasn't really changed much over the years because there's not often other opportunities for them. And so you have to ask, what are the courses for study for a student that's impacted by a disability post-secondary? Start with your school. Then go to your state education agency. Your state education agency should have somebody in charge of transition at the state level. 
um, go to government agencies in a major city near you um, and local um, agencies as well. Um, and next we have to monitor and track the progress. The point of writing a goal is not to check a box. I don't want teachers walking around the checklist. Did we move the cheese? Did, did he enjoy and working on that deficit so that he could have a gain so he could be employed, right? Um, this young man that um, we wrote these goals for, he literally did them all and blew them out of the water. He was so excited to go to school. Um, and the school was letting him to go to school two hours a day because they had told him and the parent for years he was unemployable. When we pulled open records, it was actually when it said employment, it said N A. So let's let's not do that. Let's not discriminate based on our assumptions and our biases. Um, and this young man is just a little beam of light, and he loves people, and he's doing great, and he's going to keep doing great things. So. Those pieces we're gonna break down into separate tra training. So transition assessments, measurable goals, the PLAF, annual IP goals, transition services, courses of study and monitoring progress, because those are all a really deep dive. Um, and I wanna really train you guys on how to write those goals, which may be way out of the box um, so that your kiddo makes gains and we can figure out where they're headed um, and what they want to do. Every horror story you've ever heard from another parent with a child with a disability is not necessarily true. It's not necessarily going to affect your child. I wouldn't necessarily listen to somebody that describes the 18 to 21 program at your school district. That might be a bias, it might be their opinion. Um, but if you believe your child needs those services, stick and stay, right? I had a, a kiddo in a district and he was like an, a National Honor Society academically but he had really low adaptive behavior. He was about four or five years old. And so it was a really hard push because he wasn't in a program to get the school to buy in that he needed access to the 18 to 21 program. It was very hard for me to get him to buy in that he needed access to the 21, 18 to 21 program. And he's doing great. Never in a self-contained unit. He was never in life skills. He didn't have an intellectual disability. But you have to identify those needs on a case by case basis, right? Um, one of the great things that we have in Texas is Texas Workforce Solutions, um, used to be called Texas Workforce Commission. Your student with disabilities can begin receiving services from them at 12, at 12. So you can go and do a full intake, they do a full vocational intake. Uh, my son did it, I remember he came home and he was like, mom, they made me pick up a brick, right? Because you know, obviously different kiddos can lift different things, but it was a really great, robust assessment. Um, it took a week so that they could figure out what he could do vocationally. So um, avail yourself of that, whatever state that you're in, um, you're going to have to do the work. The school does not have the depth and breadth of knowledge that, that you need for your kiddo to be successful, but you have to have a transition plan and you have to have one that sets them up for success post-secondary. And so all of our kids are amazing. All of our kids can be um, successfully supported and or employed, um, have supported living. And sometimes that supported living is just in their room. Maybe today we made our bunk bed, right? Um, but you are going to have to petition the school for that. It's not my experience. That's just going to happen naturally. I um, A couple of years ago, I was a co-speaker, Dr. Justin Porter, who's the executive director of special ed in Texas. And um, people, we fight so hard for special ed in the beginning and all of us back up at the end, which is the time that you need to press in to make sure that your kiddo gets those services. So um, that's a little bit of a framework. We're gonna open up the questions. I'm gonna have, Courtney, I'm gonna unmute you if I'm not, if I'm not smart. Um, um, not that I don't want our other friends. Did I unmute you? Yes, ma'am. Did I ask to unmute you? Yes. So um, if you guys have questions, and I'm sure you do have, have different questions in the chat. Yes. We're good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if you guys have questions, put them in the chat. And then Courtney, we're going to walk through them and go through them. Kind of what your challenges are. Um, did, did you even know you had a transition supplement? Who's in charge of transition? What are you talking about? Um, so whatever your questions are, ask them so we can get them answered for you and kind of resource you guys. So you want to read the first question, Courtney? So our first 
question is, is there a recommendation for a transition assessment? Yes, there is. Um, so it depends on your child's needs, right? So um, there is a great website called askjan.com. You can put that in the chat, askjan.com. Amazing. Um, there are um, on texasprojectfirst.org, texasprojectfirst.org. Um, there are um, transition assessment. Again, it's based on your child's needs, right? If your child um, has a mild disability, uh, a moderate or profound disability, those types of assessments are different. There's a, a formal FVE, a functional vocational evaluation um, for my kiddos that are greatly impacted by their disability that I have the school administer like when they're in 10th grade or uh, 11th grade. Um, but that may not be a appropriate for a kiddo that has, you know, a more robust um, cognitive ability. So first you want to ask your school, what is, what's the transition assessment that you use? Oh, we didn't use one. Great. When will you be giving them a transition assessment, right? So I come from the place, I assume the order. So what day will you be getting the transition assessment? They have to have a transition assessment. I talked to Billy for 10 minutes the day before the IEP meeting, not a transition assessment. Um, there's a, a great website called Texas Reality Check, which every, every child leaving your home when you pay all their bills and populate all the food in the refrigerator should, should do. And it just sort of tells you what, what's real life, right? If you wanna live where your parents live, what does that cost? Transition is the same thing for any kid. Only in special ed, we have a legal requirement to make a plan. And so if you're, um, I have a lot of kids with disabilities that they're going to live with their brother, right? And they're going to live in these apartments. Okay, well, uh, whatever kind of kiddo you are, whether you have a disability or don't, children are usually unaware of the cost it costs to live, right? If you're going to need um, tra um, transportation, um, a, a bus system or a subway or train, you don't live out where there isn't one, right? And so those are things that you have to think about and prepare that student. But those are really good resources. Um, and we can, Courtney, we'll drop those in the chat. Um, you're going to have to do it. Um, but without that assessment, we're just guessing. We're just asking him, what do you like? What do you like? What do you like does not help you, help you get ready um, for post-secondary success. How do we identify a student interest and what they want to be if they are not able to be exposed to different careers? Okay, so how do we, um, so is that somebody here, if, if the person that asked that question could just unmute their little screen and give me a little more context around that, because I'm, I'm going to assume or two, I don't want to, I don't want to be able to help answer your question correctly. Sure, Karen. So this is Vijaya. Hi there. Hi, how are you? <laughs> good, good. So if, um, so I'm, I'm just going to take my kids example, right? So what if they don't know what are those careers or what kind of opportunities or what they want to be, how do we really kind of, you know, the first question they ask to any parent is, what do you envision for your child? It's, it's, a, it's a very uh, difficult, challenging question because if I ask the same question to my child, the child doesn't know what to answer. So, uh, so how do we really um, answer that question and how do we really figure out what interests that student and how do we determine the career path for them? So I think that's probably the best question ever. And you guys, that is often a trick. That's often a trick. What do you, do you envision for your child? Well, if you've never seen a child who was in a wheelchair, who had, who was nonverbal with partial use of one arm, you probably don't envision because you haven't seen it done somewhere else. So be careful how you answer those questions. I envision my kid being amazing like he is now. As a parent, when you're wanting to envision what your child wants, it's very hard for you not to raise a little bit of you, right? So when my kids were born, they were going to be the quarterback for the University of Texas, which they, they need one right now, um, and the cheerleader for the University of Texas, because I went there, right? So we often, you know, give them what we want, or we give them what we think will keep them safe. The first thing that you want to do for a child when you envision their future, whoever they are, is what do they like? Do, do they like to be alone? Do they like to be with other people? 
that's really a good starting place, right? And if you have a kiddo that likes to be alone or with people, that cuts everything in half, right? Do they like tasks? Do they like, like that little boy said, do they like air conditioning? I love air conditioning. So when you dial down um, what are their natural temperaments, um, what do they gravitate towards, then you can build what um, those opportunities are. So I've had lots of kiddos that were um, greatly impacted by their disability and they want to be doctors. And that's fantastic because dad's a doctor, right? So there's a lot of jobs that you can have at a hospital and not be a doctor. And so often I frame it around that. What are you good at? Um, what do you like? What do you enjoy? What is your tolerance level? Right? Can, can you work for two hours? Do you want to work for two hours? Um, but that, when, when you say that and they ask you at, at the meeting, you, I really want to caution you because um, it's sort of a, if you don't know the answer, then you're bound by it, which is what happened to this little boy. They had never known anybody that was deaf and mostly nonverbal that had been employed that had an intellectual disability, right? We don't, you know, disabilities are a low percentage. Um, low incident disabilities, those that are sensory, right? And vision, those are even lower. So we don't have a bunch of people with those um, areas that are compromised and have disabilities that we can see being employed, right? And so um, that's where I would start. And, and I would ask them, what do you mean by that? I'm all about flipping the question. But I, I envision him being amazing, just like he is now. You tell me the steps to get there, right? It is not your job to educate your student. It's the public school that takes public funds and federal funds. It's also not the student's job to teach the school how they learn. It's the school's job to learn how they learn. And we should know by 12, 13, 14, 15, what, what is that student good at? What does that student want to do? Because being an adult is usually a long time, right? And I have families that don't participate in a robust transition um, and they're blessed financially. And they call me and they have a 26 year old sitting at home playing video games. And at that point, it's going to be hard for me to help you, right? I think it's really important too, that if your child needs to be supported as an adult, that you consider guardianship. I know that there's this huge push for supported student decisions. And that sounds great, but a student supported decision is really good until they take it. And then there, there's your student supported decision, right? So I, I get it, but if your child can be taken advantage of emotionally or financially, I would very much direct you to reach out to a probate attorney to look into guardianship. Why? Um, because that there's two kinds of guardianship, guardianship of your person and guardianship of your estate. And so kiddos with disabilities have often have a, their innocence and, and they, you know, somebody comes up and says, Hey, um, I, I'd love, I'm really, I don't have much money. They work together, you know, and I don't have a thousand dollars for my rent and they go and give them a thousand dollars out of their account. It's over. I can't run up for my 20 year olds that I was their advocate and go, oh, he has an IEP. He has an IEP. No, what's done is done. And so that process starts the day they turn 17. And then guardianship is for 16 months. Um, we have some trainings on that. Um, but it's about protecting your child. It doesn't mean they can't work. It doesn't mean they can't do a lot of things. There's, a, there's usually more fear than facts. Um, but it's about protecting your child until they're able to be responsible for their person and or their estate um, or for the, to you know, for whatever time that you need it. Um, but I think a lot of schools, a lot of schools are talking about, you know, um, supported decision making. That's really good till they tear it up, right? Um, and the legal protections are under guardianship if your child is greatly impacted by their ability, by their executive functioning by their cognitive deficits, um, by their behavioral uh, or functional needs. So that would be my recommendation. I don't know if that answered your question, um, but I would ask the school, what are the resources that you have based on my cherub's amazingness to help him be successful as adult? You ask them, what resources do you have at Elm High School to make my amazing kiddo be a successful adult? Because you don't work there. And even if you didn't were a school person, 
when you are in a meeting with your child, you are in trauma. It is traumatic to sit at a special ed meeting for 10, 12, eight years. It is. And the reason that when you go and get maybe bad medical news and they say, bring somebody with you is because it's hard to hear when you're in trauma. It's hard to make good informed decisions. So I would flip it and say, tell me what amazing set of coordinated activities and services and products that you have to make him successful when he leaves this school at 18, 19, 20, 21, or 22. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you, Karen. Yes. Yes. All right, Ms. Courtney, what's the next question? Is it, is this my natural hair color? Is that the next question? It's not. Um, do you recommend TEC assessment for vocational for all students at 12 to start the transition planning? So TEC, what does that stand for? TEC. Help me, who is the lovely person that asked the question? Heidi. Heidi, what is TEC, the great Heidi? Da, 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 da. Heidi's probably wrangling her children. So read me the question again, Courtney. Do you recommend TEC assessment for vocational for all students at 12 to start the transition planning? So I recommend a transition assessment. Does it mean, you're, I mean your kid might be a brain surgeon and live at home the rest of their life based on their executive functioning, right? So we want a transition assessment that's appropriate based on their unique needs and their disability. We're not saying that every kiddo is going to need, is going to do something functional for a living. Lots of our kiddos go to college, just like we talked about um, um, HTC, Houston Community College has a full program for kiddos that can read at the ninth, at the third grade level. And they do. So um, I wouldn't limit it to a vocational assessment, um, but if that's what they're tracking towards and that's what they like, um, do that. There are kiddos that, you know, have, you know, uh, an IEP and they have ADHD and they want to do something in the vocational space. That's fine. Just because we're an, an honor roll student, we don't have to go to a four-year college. But yes, a, an appropriate transition assessment. And ask your school, what appropriate transition assessment are you going to provide my cherub so that we can have a good transition plan? Next question. What grade do you start transition assessment for planning? Is it eighth grade or ninth grade? Sure, so the federal requirement is at 16. And so the government wants you to start that within a year of them turning 16. So let's say your kiddo is gonna be 16 in April. This would be the time that you start that, right? So that when you get to that age, it's in place. Um, in Texas, it's 14. So we would say if the IEP year, the student's going to turn 13, and we start providing that assessment and that transition plan. Okay, this is a really long question. Um, recommendation for a district that has 18 to 21 program and they typically only serve students on the lower functioning end. ARD committee recommends for high functioning student to attend 18 to 21 program due to needs for all the soft skills, executive fun function, independent skills. The 1821 program representative is struggling to individualize the plan for a high functioning student. Job coaching option being given is working at a local, local grocery train chain three to four days a week. Student walks around the mall. None of these are appropriate for this student recommendations for goals are all based on observation by staff, district stating that's how we do transition. Last nine years, that's what we do. So does appropriately ambitious apply for 18 to 21 programs? Appropriately ambitious applies to anybody in special ed from three to 22. So that's what we do is as not, I don't know what, who we are, um, but that's not okay. So I would absolutely be on the phone with the U.S. Department of Education Office of Civil Rights because that's discrimination based on disability. There's no category for the 18 to 21 program. And there just isn't. Um, and many districts either put you in the 18 to 21 program because they think you're employable or they put you in the 18 to 21 program for just a couple hours a day. So that's discrimination based on disability 
Um, I would, you know, I have, a, I have a big mouth and it's always open. But at the end of the day, each meeting is about one child. These are not cattle. These are children. We don't group them. Um, the I stands for individualized. So again, that's why it's so vehemently important that we are putting in those threshold goals in the document at 14, 15, 16. A goal for him to be successful, living, not, not wiping down tables at school. And I'm not being disrespectful, but we had a, um, a due process hearing and the person in that was the witness for the school district said, you know, like him taking a rag and wiping down tables. She said the word rag. So I, I, I think that's all kinds of wrong. But again, we know what we've taught. And if, if we've always taught kiddos and they don't go to general ed at starting at junior high, then we have a broken system, right? Um, so again, the point of this is to make sure that you have goals in place that keeps the school on a requirement to continue educating your child. The 18 to 21 program has nothing to do with academics. You're not going to be doing functional reading, not be doing functional. You have met your graduation requirements. That's where people get confused, right? I'm going to go there and have a little more science and a little more. So no, you're not. It's all about gainful employment, independent living, and further education. So you need to have those goals inside of the IEP document um, and not just some goal labeled vocational. Um, that situation, I would, you know, I think we know what I would do. Um, I would do a TikTok live in front of the school district, and I'm happy to do that. Just call me. Um, it's unfortunate. Um, it's abusive. And it's not unusual. It just isn't. Um, if you look at the numbers that are in need of 18 to 21 programs and the numbers of kiddos and districts that actually go, um, you can go to your state and get those numbers. How many kiddos? Um, we're in a self-contained setting as 12th graders. How many kiddos are in the 18 to 21 program? It's simple math. And part of that is we have not fully informed parents um, opportunities for their child that's greatly impacted by their disability. And we, we have to change that. And I find that most people that love kiddos in those programs, they don't, they don't know about supported, they really have no idea what I'm talking about. Right, because we take them out to work-based learning and we take them all to a location and we do the same thing, right? And um, yeah, so there's that. And you can always put like a candy bar in that person's gas tank. I mean, I don't recommend that, but you know, it happens. Uh, someone commented TEC is Texas Employment Commission or the work source. Yeah, so it's, um, it's TWS, Texas Workforce Solutions. We call it different things. So those services with a child with disability start at 12. And they have great, they have camps, they have, I call it the try it before you buy it. You can intern as a 12 year old over Christmas break, spring break, summer break, get those kids started as quickly as you can. Um, I don't know how many people that go to a four year college that are neurotypical and never do their degree. Cause we don't ask kids, well, do you like people? No. <laughs> do you want to work by yourself? We don't, we don't ask any kid just basic questions. So um, yes, and if you're going to access Texas Workforce Solutions or any of those places in your city, do not send an email. We call that a waste of time. You show up like Shirley McLean in terms of endearment, you all are too young to know what that is, and you knock on the door and you say, hey, here's my cherub, we'd like an intake. The squeaky wheel always gets the oil. Uh, B. Turner. Says, not a question, just a comment as a teacher. When asked what your post secondary plans are for your child, I would advise against saying, oh, they're going to live with me and I'm going to take care of his or her needs. This could be misconstrued that your student doesn't have any post secondary goals and/or plans, and I will use that and will use that to deny a student from continuing into 18 plus program. Right. And that's that's right, because you you've relieved them of their responsibility. You got it. I got it from here. Right. So if you're going to do all that, then the assumption is you're going to train him for gainful employment, independent living and further education. That's really important that when they ask you those questions, the great answer is I'm not sure yet. Right. I'm not sure yet. Um, but those are rocks that people die on. 
good that's a good st um statement thank you we're at the end of questions we're at the end of questions okay so does anybody on here with all their fancy names and um have any questions about how to build a, a transition plan into your child's IEP that's full of academic goals, behavior goals, um, functional goals, communication goals. Has anybody, let me ask you this, has anybody been asked as a parent to build a transition supplement in their child's IEP? Okay. You can just put up your little imaginary hand. Anybody? Maybe I'm looking at the wrong screen. Yeah. You know who knows the most about the child? The owner. <laughs> so the parent knows the most about the child um, and their needs. And so you're going to have to make sure that those needs are documented. Here's what happens legally. If it's not documented, didn't happen. You could have told the school forever that you're so excited about that program. It's not documented. Just like when I get families and they've been unhappy for years and years and years and you signed an agreement. Ooh, it's either documented or it's not. I think my kiddo is going to be amazing. I think all my kiddos are going to be amazing do amazing. Do I know what that looks like when they're 18? I don't, I don't have a, my crystal ball is in the shop, not expected to be repaired, but I think he's going to be amazing. Tell me what you're going to do to help him get there. That's their job. That's what public education does. Um, but the cases that I see are just egregious. I had a kiddo who I love and is amazing. And her dad had a, has had one of the most robust transition plans I've ever seen. He sings um, and he was going to go around and do these motivational talks with her. She has a voice and she has a VOCD, a voice output communication device. Um, I Years ago, I got her a full-time communication partner. I got a voice output device for a school and home. You know, it's just $16,000. And we had like, like before me that this was the plan. When she graduates, she'll do this. And literally at her February of senior year ARD, which is what we call it in Texas because we're different, IEP meeting, they said, well, she's good. What? What do you mean she's good? Yeah, I mean, you don't have a post-secondary goal. And we literally had been talking about it for years and had captured it in the transition supplement. But you have to realize every year, somebody else gets your paperwork. And as I always say in my training, you got to tell the whole story every time. And I know that it's exhausting but you have to assume that everybody's brain has been abducted or they have no idea what you're talking about. The volume of cases that teachers and service providers and diagnosticians and LSSPs and coordinators are responsible for is, is insane. And when they're really good at their job, then they give them 50 more things to do. So assuming that because you roll in, they know about your child, it's, it's just not true. So you're, nobody's a better advocate than you are for your kiddo. So you got to retell the story again. You have to make sure that those present levels are accurate and that you have real robust goals so the student can be successful post-secondary and or participate in that 18 to 21 program. Um, it's not, it's, they're not going to just open the door. That's the most expensive kiddo at the school, those young adults, they are. And so um, it's, an, it's a numbers thing. It's, um, it's a belief system and some some people have an antiquated belief system about individuals with disabilities and probably always will. And so you have to make sure that that transition plan is in place. Um, and, and then we'll do separate trainings on the assessments, the goals, parent and student participation, the coordinated set of activities. When you say that to people at school, they're like, what? Coordinated, what's well, an activity, right? Um, and you know, I, I don't want my kids wiping down a table in that cafeteria. I don't want my kids pushing around the coffee cart. I find that offensive. If you don't, push the coffee cart. But we have these set little things that we make let our kids do. I don't know, do any of y'all push around a coffee cart? I don't. So you need to make sure that your child's plan is specific to their needs um, and that the school is working on targeting skills and building um, those areas of deficit so they can be successful. Because when they leave public school, it, it's over. You don't, you don't get to go back. Um, also, additionally, um, I've had families, um, let's say that you want to participate in the 18 to 21 program and you never went to public school. Can you do that? You can, you sure can. And I'm really good at just showing up with a six foot two young man going, we'd like to go to the 18 to 21 program, right? Because those parents have chosen 
to homeschool their student. So whether or not they've been in special ed before, if there's an evaluation and there's a need, absolutely they have an opportunity to access that program. So that's sort of a, a misnomer that comes out um, for kiddos um, in that. I, and I wanted to just kind of touch back on the guardianship. I All my families are amazing. Um, and I've had so many families say, oh, I don't want to do that, Karen. I don't want to do that. I don't want to get guardianship. And I say to them, did you know that your child can sign themselves out of school at 18? He wouldn't do that. Um, did, did you know that your child could give all the way his money away in the ATM? No, he wouldn't do that. Okay. <laughs> so there's real ramifications around that. Um, and you know, obviously when your child turns 17, there's going to be that conversation about the age of majority and transfer of rights. Doesn't matter how greatly they're impacted by their disability they're in charge of the meeting now, you're not. So make sure that you really um, figure that out and that you talk to an attorney about what those implicate, the, you know, the benefits and the, um, the, the, the pros and the cons of that so that your child can be protected. Um, but avail yourself of those, um, um, of that information so you can be fully informed and, and not get the supported decision-making. I, I just think that's amazing that that's the new push. So, all right, you've all been so well-behaved. Tiqua, did you have any questions? I feel like you have a question. No? Actually, okay, I did. Um, I had a question about, um, the program that is in Houston, I've talked with some people at a and and it's an absolutely amazing program. Um, but just a, could you give us any more information about the one that's actually in Houston? You said at third grade reading level? That's really awesome. Sure. Yeah, so um, the great Sue Maraska is in charge of it. I think she just got awarded 25 years or she's all about commitment. She's amazing, rock star. Um, so it's a program at Houston Community College um, and um, it's basically resource or special ed in college. And you have to read it at a third grade level because that's the, how the content is delivered. Um, but I have kiddos that graduate with an associate's degree there, right? So it's not the all or nothing, right? I, I allegedly was book smart and slept my way through my first two semesters of college and they said, you can go now. So for your college, I don't know who it's for. It's not for everybody period, whether you have a disability or not. Um, but that's a great program. It's called the VAST program, V-A-S-T. It's amazing. Um, amazing. Thank is you. It ja yeah. Is it Jahida? It's amazing. I knew how to say that, isn't it? Yes. So like <laughs> do you have a question? Um, well, my baby's only five. Um, but um, I do have a question. Um, it's not about transition. Can I ask? You can ask. Okay. So um, in the last R meeting, um, we were trying, because I saw one of your TikTok videos. So I was trying to tell them, she, my baby, she has autism. And so she doesn't understand what's right and wrong. And that's something that the ABA therapist and the teacher had have concerns she's constantly asking people and I'm doing things right and, and I'm behaving and I'm good even when she does good so they put her on ISS a whole day uh from a -year -old? yes from eight in the morning to what? yes three o'clock and um the, my concern was the teacher provide her candy and she was out of control and um because she did nobody could control her they put her in ISS they they couldn't control her in ISS neither so they had to call me several times to go to the ISS room um and so I wanted to put on her IEP about the student conduct so that doesn't happen again and um, the supervisor of the SPED um, program told me that, that that they're not allowed to do that so um I'm going to do this. I'm going to stop the video for the transition. You guys all stay on. Um, 